Welcome back one and all to another episode of The Damage War with me, John Arola, and very lucky to be joined on the show by one of my favorite people, Mayor of Enfield, North Carolina, as well as the founding principal of the Black Male Voter Project, Monel Robinson. Welcome back to the show. Thank you, sir. It's good to have you. I'm, I'm excited to have you here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so everyone out there, I need you to buckle up because we got a lot to talk about. And um, we've been trying to do a little bit, I don't know, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go crazy and say a deep dive, but it's not a shallow dive either. It's very much an in the middle dive um, into a few little like thematic topics. Um, sometimes I'll like mash up a couple of like state legislative acts or something. So I have an example of that today and it has to do with Ron DeSantis. I mashed up a few of the troubles that he's facing in his uh, not even yet announced run against Donald Trump. So uh, we're gonna have a little bit of fun with that, uh, including a preview of some of the troubles to come for Ron DeSantis. Uh, we also are gonna be talking uh, more than you might think about Disney today, multiple times in the first hour as well as in the aftermath. Disney is all over the news. We're gonna be talking about taxes. What do the patriotic millionaires think should happen when it comes to taxes on the uber wealthy and of of course, it's America, so we've got more completely um, uh, needless and tragic shootings to uh, cover as well. So a lot obviously going on. We're gonna cap off the hour with Marjorie Green declaring war on a bunch of the other crazies on the right. And uh, you know, our, strat- our, our stance on that is always let them fight. So they're fighting, it's getting pretty brutal, and we're going to be breaking it down. In advance of all that though, if you wouldn't mind hitting the like button and sharing the stream, that would be great so the people know we're live. And if you wanna reach out to us with any tweets, super chats, comments, anything like that, uh, Mondale and I will respond as we go. Particularly insightful or perhaps funny comments might even give you a chance at winning a $100 Blue Apron gift card. So get those comments in. But with all that said, Mondale, are you ready to start the show? Let's do this. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it together. Ron DeSantis isn't even technically running against Donald Trump yet, except he is, he is. He's like literally campaigning in swing states on a weekly basis, hawking the book that someone else wrote for him. And despite the fact that he hasn't announced, behind the scenes, a lot is going on. A lot of truly desperate acts of a guy terrified at what has become of his political futures, including his efforts to stop Florida Republicans from endorsing Donald Trump. Again, remember, he's not even technically running. He's never said that he's definitely going to. And yet they are reaching out to all of these Florida Republicans and be like, please stop endorsing Donald Trump, you're killing me. And so um, the efforts not working great so far. Uh, Byron Donalds has endorsed Donald Trump. Uh, had previously been a DeSantis ally, but you know, you see what uh, loyalty is worth, I guess. Uh, Anna Paulina Luna, Matt Gates, and Corey Mills also have endorsed Donald Trump. That's not super surprising, but all of that, by the way, is before we found out about this behind the scenes full court press to get them to back off and not endorse Trump. Um, that said, let's check in on how the effort is going with GOP representative from Florida, Greg Stube. He hasn't even been elected, reelected for six months. Yeah. Uh, and while we're in legislative session right now and the state legislature is doing their business, uh, he's in South Carolina and Iowa. I think he's up here in Washington uh, tomorrow meeting with people where his focus should be in Florida. Uh, Floridians want him to be focused on Florida. That's what he yeah. signed up for his job for reelection to do. So if that seems to indicate that Greg Stube is no longer a massive fan of the presidential aspirations of Ron DeSantis telling him to go back to his state and stay there. Well, just to clinch it, he just endorsed Donald Trump as well. So that makes five Florida Republicans that have now come out and said before everyone's even announced that no, we're just we're sticking with Donald Trump. All this nonsense about us moving on or going back to a more responsible Republican party. Screw all that noise. We want Trump. What do you think, Mondale? Well, I mean, let's be let's be clear, John. Is DeSantis really more responsible as a Republican Party? I think he's as reckless as Donald Trump. He's willing to say more, and he might even be dangerous, more dangerous because he understands how government work. I'll tell you what's what's mm-hmm. super disgusting. While we see Republicans at this at the federal level willing to come out and endorse Trump, what's super scary to me are those Floridas. Those Florida Republicans in the state legislature that are willing to change Florida's law to make it smooth and easier for the Senators to run for president, right? Like in Florida, you can't be the nominee for a presidential candidate and also the governor. You have to resign. So they're trying to change the law to make it easier for this scum to come and you know, you know, plenty 
his scum all over the United States. Oh. So I'm a little nervous about you know DeSantis, not because I feel like he can win on a national scale. I'm just afraid of what Florida is willing to do to make Florida man America man. Yeah, you, you know, I'm glad that you you made the, you pointed that out because again, there's so much about what happens in Florida that like it's really just about DeSantis, and I kind of feel like the entire state's politics are not supposed to be about one individual, like his war with Disney, which we're going to talk about, is just that's just about him. It's not about Floridians or whatever. Literally changing the law to rec- to make it so that he can run for both. First of all, is it's like wildly unfair that you're changing the law for one man. Let's be let's be real. They they institute that, and I'm not even saying that that law should or shouldn't exist, but it does exist. You put it into effect for a reason. It also, by the way, can we just acknowledge that that's not like a super strong indication of the faith that you have in Ron DeSantis? Like that's allowing him to run and keep his spot. But if you were really confident he was going to win, you wouldn't need the built-in backup of being the governor of Florida. So. A little bit pathetic if you ask me. But what I find interesting, and I'm not, I don't think DeSantis needs to worry about this too much, but you have these congressional Republicans in Florida that are turning on him and endorsing Donald Trump. Wouldn't it be amazing if Donald Trump were behind the scenes to be working on the state legislators in Florida? And when they try to change the law to let DeSantis run, it fails. <laughs> Can you imagine if he were to win over enough of them with promises of bringing them up to cabinet positions and all that, that he legally is barred from running? That would be amazing. I don't think that that's gonna happen, but I, I like to fantasize sometimes, Mondale. No, I think, but you know, in your fantasy, I think you, you point out some amazing things. The idea that Donald, I mean, that Ron DeSantis is at war with Disney. You can't make sense of making war with Disney if you are the governor of Florida. We're talking about the lo- the largest single employer in your state and you're making war because they said something they wanted to say. Think about this, we're talking about the Republican Party, free speech party. You can't tell businesses that they can't sell gay people cakes and flowers for their wedding. But now you can tell the mouse who he can and can't represent or protect because he's anti your your regressive policy. So I think it's hilarious mm-hmm. to see DeSantis and the state legislatures show up in this manner. And like you said, you never know what Trump is trumping. So it may be possible that he could you know, convince some of these Republicans, hey, this is a sink and sail. And that while DeSantis can win in Florida, all the polls say he cannot win nationally. And it just keeps getting worse for him. Yeah, yeah. and by the way, I, I don't even look. I, I don't really want them to stop him from running because I think that if he runs against Trump, it's gonna be hilarious. Um, But that said, I I feel obligated to just say, if any uh, Florida state legislators are watching the damage report right now, like you don't think there's at least a good chance that Trump is going to see what you do when you allow DeSantis to run against him? Does he seem like the sort of person to hold a grudge? Now, maybe you're thinking, I'm gonna be in the legislature for like four or six more years before I try for anything else and Donald Trump will probably croaked by then. But is that, a, is that the gamble that you want to make on your political future? Something to think about. Uh, that said, let's move to another aspect of this. Ron DeSantis is having trouble getting Florida Republicans to endorse him. But he also might have some trouble in the future when it comes to donors because some of them are apparently starting to sour on him. Top Republican donor Thomas Petterfee is halting plans apparently to help finance Ron DeSantis's bid for the presidency. Apparently due to his extreme positions on social issues. Quote, I have put myself on hold, the billionaire told the Financial Times. Because of his stance on abortion and book banning, myself and a bunch of friends are holding our powder dry. By the way, like the fact that he doesn't support DeSantis's positions on abortion and book banning, I like that. I feel like I, you could throw a few more things in there. I mean, all the anti-trans stuff and the obvious racism and everything. Like, you know, if you're already hitting the guy, at least mention some of the other terrible things. Maybe he doesn't have a problem with that. I don't know. But anyway, he did say it's not just him; it's a bunch of his friends. And when a billionaire says a bunch of his friends, he just means the other rich people in the area. That's all that means. They're not getting together to play bridge or something. And he's pretty significant. He's the second richest man in Florida. Up until very recently, he was the richest man in Florida. Just in 2022, he gave $7.7 million to individual Republican campaigns and conservative PACs. That was up from 7.2 million in 2020, which is the sort of money one person spends in politics that immediately tells me that their taxes aren't high enough. But anyway, um, 
I, I think it's interesting that his donors are starting to back off Mondale and in particular citing his culture war stances, which are like exactly why some I think deluded poor conservatives like DeSantis in the first place. Yeah, and I think you see now they have this. The Republican Party has come to this point where, okay, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna serve the money donors or you're gonna serve the people, and the base is what you need in the Republican primary to get out of the primary. So at this point, I guess DeSantis is saying these donors can go bye bye because I need to win the base, and to win the base, you gotta out Trump Trump. The problem with that is you need money to out Trump Trump because Trump's gonna generate a lot of free press, which he did. He generated billions of dollars of free press in his first presidential run. So what DeSantis is up against is reality, mm-hmm. <laughs> reality. You're trying to out Trump Trump in a game that you can't win because donors are scared of you. Plus you have no national record and your backbone isn't really there. We've seen people push back on policies and you fail epically. Yeah. And I think and I think people I think it would be important if people don't forget that the reason he became governor in 2018 is a fault of the Democratic Party, not because of some excellent race he was winning. He was losing that race up until a few a few you know a few weeks according to the polls, but if you saw how Democrats performed in the primary, they outperformed Republicans in the primary in 2018 and Andrew Gillum was poised to win that election except for he turned over his entire field team that had just won him in the primary with record turnout to the Democratic Party and that yeah. and that was a bad idea because they weren't knocking on doors and when they were they were using whitewashed messaging to reach I mean you were sending regular English language to completely black communities that were Haitian speaking communities. So these people don't even speak English and you're sending them lit. This is why we saw 13% of black women in Georgia, I mean Florida vote against Andrew Gillum in 2018. Bad policies, bad practices on mm-hmm. the Democratic Party put put DeSantis in place. That's not gonna happen on the national level because there's gonna be so much money spent against him if he was to beat Donald Trump. Yeah, by the way, I am so glad that you brought that up because you're right. Like everybody like thinks about this last election. They're like, oh, DeSantis was always gonna win. It's a super red district. It was a super close race anyway. It was totally winnable. And I don't want to go off on a long tangent, but imagine how much would be different right now if that race had gone differently. Not only would Ron DeSantis, I don't know, maybe he'd be running again next time, but that would probably be the extent of his national platform. Uh, we wouldn't have the six week abortion ban in Florida. All the nonsense that's happened with trying to destroy schools and ban the teaching of history and everything. Oh, You wouldn't have Ron DeSantis been unilaterally creating a redistricting map that sent multiple congressional seats to the Republicans. Like either the Republican right, the Republican majority in the house right now would be incredibly minor, one or two people, or it might even be flipped if not for that. So man, the Democrats love to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. Anyway, really fast, just to end on Petterfee, he says that if DeSantis continues to appeal to a far right base of the Republican Party to defeat Trump by banning books or restricting abortion access, quote, the Republicans have a very big problem. Well, it's certainly gonna be a big problem for DeSantis if he is the nominee running in a national election. He's the guy that effectively entirely outlawed abortion in an entire state. Petterfee, by the way, says he doesn't even think Trump can win the next election, but he's willing to sit out and let Trump be the nominee. If that's what it takes to put pressure on DeSantis, which I think is interesting. And here's the thing, Petterfee is a billionaire and billionaires generally get almost everything that they want in America. That's the way that things are set up. But if what he wants is for Ron DeSantis to back off the culture wars, I think for the first time he is going to be disappointed because I just happened to cross this today. Fox News reporting that Team DeSantis has put out a new parody video mocking Bud Light for supporting women's sports. I am not going to play this video because it's utterly gross. But here's the basic idea. It's titled Real Men of Women's Sports. It parodies the old Real Men of Genius campaign from the company from the late 1990s and early 2000s. It says Team DeSantis presents Real Men of Women's Sports and then begins to attack Leah Thomas and other transgender athletes saying that they are the real men of sports. They have found a way to hack the system so that they can win. And now women's sports doesn't have real women winning anymore. It just has, you'll notice by the way that they're mentioning one actual name. That's literally the only name they can come up with. The rest of it's all incredibly vague because this is a made up problem that doesn't actually exist in the real world. But this is what Ron DeSantis, the reasonable Republican, the not threatening or dangerous Republican is using his time for. Once again, weighing in on a culture war topic that has absolutely nothing to do with him or his state. 
and being willing to increase the threat of harassment, violence, and even murder for transgender people because he thinks it might help him close the gap a bit with Trump. It's gross. What do you think, Mondale? I think you're spot on. I think what and what's what's also telling is, listen, let's not disconnect this world from the past world, right? I'm talking about the banning of books and how extreme this really is. This billionaire may not be saying it for a good reason, but it's absolutely devastating. And we should acknowledge that the first time we started banning books, Southerners started believing that <laughs> that the rebels that fought against the Union, right, the Confederacy, was a was a lost cause effort. It was a States rights effort and not because of slavery. And I mean, this was the power of banning books in the South, throughout the South. United Daughters of Confederacy ran this campaign that was super successful and created a book list that said to libraries and schools, like these are the books that you should ban. If they say this about rebels or if they call them rebels and not if they yeah. give, if they, you know, so all of this has ramifications and it looks the same. And DeSantis is not divorced from this information. He understands the culture war that he's playing and he's willing to gamble at that because. One, he's raising a ton of money doing this. His super PAC just bought a seven digit, seven digit ad spin, and he's not even announced presidency yet. Yeah, so, wow. I mean, this idea that you can mock people, it doesn't matter as long as it's other than white people that you're mocking. And not just white people, those who support and believe in the idea of white supremacy, whiteness. And he's going along with that, even in a state that shouldn't even be uh, you know, a red state at all. But like I said, like you said, from the lack of effort from people on our side, we allow people like this to be in office. Yeah, yeah. We should also yeah. mention, John, we should also mention before we go off this topic, that DeSantis is also the governor that's actually locking people up for voting when his state, his state supposedly gave people with felony conviction the right to vote again and then are telling these people to register, but locking some of them up because they have felony convictions that are violent or related to violent yeah. crimes. That is absolutely voter suppression in the craziest form. 100%. His, his efforts to disenfranchise people's vote is so ridiculous that even in Florida, when they were going, some of these cops to lock up people of color for voting, the cops were like, this is ridiculous. You have to be pretty extreme to get the cops to have a problem with it in Florida, and they did. Um, really fast, before we move on to our last uh, aspect, I also wanna mention that uh, Trump has hired a former top DeSantis ally who apparently wants nothing more than to destroy DeSantis now. This is Susie Wiles, I'm gonna keep it real, I don't know anything about her. She's apparently really important to DeSantis in the past. According to Roger Stone, she knows where DeSantis's bodies are buried. I don't know what's gonna come of this, but I am tantalized by it, I will say that. Anyway, let's turn to one other aspect of this. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis has announced that the next phase of his personal crusade against Disney, one of the main employers in his state, is going to escalate quickly. So you might recall that he tried to take over their sort of like independent operating body that controlled that area. And then they had this last minute little clever little legal maneuver that allowed them to retain control. He doesn't like that because it makes him look ridiculous and everybody on the internet laughed at him. So now he's gonna try to just nullify it. He says Disney's sloppy and futile attempt to subvert the will of the legislature and Floridians. Yeah, lots of Floridians def desperately care about this. Will, was uncovered by our state oversight board and their 11th hour agreements will be nullified by the legislature. Disney's corporate kingdom is over. I will just remind you that while I am all for regulation of corporations, it generally is not supposed to be the case that the government just goes on an extended vendetta against one individual corporation for purely personal reasons. That's not really how our government is supposed to work. You don't like the little tricky pizzicky thing that they did, but they did it. And now the state legislature is gonna weigh in so that you can stick it to this very popular company in your state that generates a bunch of tax revenue and hires a bunch of people, okay. Well, it goes beyond just the nullification. He said, come to think of it now, people are like, well, what should we do with this land? Maybe we'll create a state park, maybe try to do more amusement parks. Someone even said like, maybe you need another state prison. I mean, who knows? I mean, I just think that the possibilities are endless. So he's talking about building a state prison next to Disney or another amusement park, which will definitely be competitive against Disney. He's also talking about just raising their taxes, raising an individual company's taxes 
as his entire party's ideology is that corporate taxes shouldn't exist in the first place. There's a little bit of a muddling of the ideology going on here, Mondale. Listen, first of all, the statement was nothing but lies and we'll get to that. Isn't Florida where people go because they don't wanna pay income taxes? <laughs> I, I, isn't that the purpose people, isn't that why so many rich people live in Florida? So I, I think this is absolutely disgusting. It's also the double speak that shows us that the Republican Party does not have principles beyond anyone that does not agree with them 100%. They will come after anything using any tactics. We saw this a long time ago, Ronald Reagan as governor of California enacted the first gun restriction laws in that state, right? When Black Panther showed up to the Capitol with with guns, he did this. Now Ron DeSantis has shown up the same way against Disney's anti-Disney because Disney's, Disney is seen anti them, even though Disney is still giving money to Republicans throughout the yep. state. This is this is gonna be this is what's gonna hamstring him. And I don't think he understands the power of Disney in Florida when you're starting to like I, I think your legislature might miss the mark and you may you may try mm -hmm. something, but what the backlash is gonna be will be no governor f from the Republican Party for a while because Disney's gonna withhold all their resources from them. Let me say one more thing about Ron DeSantis. He has a bigger problem. You breezed over it, John, but it's a big deal. Susie Wow against Susie Wow in Florida against DeSantis is problematic. She is the reason Trump won Florida the way he did twice. She is not to play with. She is, she is the Republican snake in the state, and Florida has a lot of snakes. I mean, that <laughs> it, it is the home. It is the home. But I mean, honestly, this is a powerful lobbyist, a powerful Republican strategist who has relationships not just in Florida, but with donors outside. And I bet you some of these conversations where donors are saying hold off. Oh, or we're holding off what we're thinking is all about that. Cuz she's probably having a conversation saying Trump don't care about half the stuff he's saying, he just wanna win. Whereas DeSantis is legislating this stuff. And that track record of legislating hate is gonna cause him uh, and the Republican Party any, any, any serious conversation or looks on a national scale. So I'm super excited about Susie being over there with Donald Trump. Okay. I'm also happy, I'm also happy that DeSantis is at war with the mouse. Yeah. Well, uh, as we're about to get to, very briefly, the mouse is uh, striking back. Uh, by the way, glad to have you on today because you have that perspective on Susie Wiles. I w wasn't personally familiar with her. Um, but here's the issue. So DeSantis trying to stick it to Disney once again. He really thinks that one of these days he's gonna come out of this looking cool. Well, uh, he's got two Disney related hits coming against him. Uh, one coming from Donald Trump who bleated, DeSantis is being absolutely destroyed by Disney. This is this morning, by the way. His original PR plan fizzled, so now he's going back with a new one in order to save face. Disney's next move will be the announcement that no more money will be invested in Florida because of the governor. In fact, they could even announce a slow withdrawal or sale of certain properties or the whole thing. Watch, that would be a killer. In the meantime, this is all so unnecessary, a political stunt. Ron should work on the squatter mess. Uh, Trump is 100% right, that's weird, well, I didn't feel quite right. Um, it is a stunt, of course, Trump engages in these sorts of stunts constantly, that's all it is. So uh, he's getting hit, by the way, you know what Disney just announced? The first ever Disneyland after dark pride night is coming to Disneyland during pride month in June. This separately ticketed event celebrating the first LGBTQIA plus community and allies will have themed entertainment, Disney characters, specialty menu items and more, suck it, puddin' Ron. They didn't say that in the tweet, but I feel like that was the subtext, the, the subtweet, if you will. Anyway, Mondale, any further thoughts? Uh, I love how Trump will call someone out for doing exactly what Trump would do, but it works for him. Like this guy has, there's no shame with Trump. The fact that he's called out the sentence, and let's be honest, this is absolutely spot on. Trump is spot on. This is a political stunt. Uh, this mm -hmm. idea that you're gonna get rid of Disney or hurt Disney or that Disney's stock is failing is a lie. Disney is doing, they're doing wonderful. They're putting out movies that are making more money than ever. And this is just opening up people's idea of the park. People that may have not, may have not thought about Disney in June because Florida's too hot will definitely be there for the pride night. So I think the Santas will lose um, and Trump is absolutely right. I don't think Disney is gonna pull out of Florida. I think they're just gonna make DeSantis look like an idiot by making more money and being more successful in his state as he waged war on them. And they just continue to ignore him or as you say, tell him to suck it. <laughs> 100%. Okay, we're gonna take our first break everyone. When we come back, we're gonna be talking about some millionaires calling for higher taxes on millionaires. They'll make the case after this.
really fast. I mentioned in that break that I had made spinach artichoke gnocchi and someone dragon bear typed ew. How dare you dragon bear, it was delicious. Don't you attack my gnocchi. Anyway, uh, with that said, let's turn from gnocchi to taxes starting with this. Seven out of 10 Americans say our democracy is under dire threat. The number one reason, 86% of those Across the partisan spectrum, no difference, Republicans, Democrats, independents, 86% say the reason is money in politics. Feel like we've been saying that for a little while. Uh, what you just saw there was a clip from the Patriotic Millionaires Summit. You might be familiar with this group, but for some time they have come together to try to advocate as people with great economic privilege for tax policy and other policies that don't so singularly advantage the wealthiest people in America. They they call themselves wealthy Americans leading the charge to raise taxes on the rich, fight for a livable wage and combat political and income inequality. And the speaker that you just saw there was saying that effectively the money in politics gives them incredibly outsized influence over politics. We say, we say outsized, the only real position on politics that matters outside of campaigns. You know, Biden might run as a progressive or whatever because he knows he wants young voters to vote for him. But what they do once they're actually in an in office has effectively, well, according to Princeton University, it has zero, near zero impact on US law. But there are obviously things affecting the law. And I think that speaker has pointed out what it actually is. It's the actual money in politics and the interests of the wealthy. And they have long advocated for their interests and they've gotten it. As of right now, the wealthiest Americans pay on average just 3.4% of their income in taxes. The people who can afford it most pay at least. And even when it's not just raw tax policy, you might be shocked at how much things have been set up for them. Even in the area of deductions for charity, here's a little bit more from the summit. When we talk about philanthropy, we really should think about it as a tax issue. For every dollar a billionaire gives to charity, we as taxpayers chip in 74 cents in lost tax revenue. Now, how is this possible? How is this possible? Because billionaires not only are reducing their income tax, they're also reducing their estate taxes, their gift tax, their capital gains tax. So it's a huge subsidy. And the problem is the wealth doesn't just go directly to the charities, but actually huge amounts of it are being diverted into, we call them intermediaries, private foundations, donor advised funds that are essentially controlled by those donors. And those funds can sit parked for generations in these intermediaries. So the donors get an immediate tax reduction the year they give the money, but it can sit for a long time. Exactly. Like there, I'm sure there's a millionaire that's given some money to charity just out of the goodness of their heart. But often it's it's for the tax incentives for individuals as well as corporations. By the way, we've previously talked about on the show why it's become so common that when you like check out at a CVS, it's asking for you to chip in money to a charity. Like it makes you feel good, I guess, that you've done the charity. But they use that for tax write-offs. Basically, if you want to give the charity. Do it independently, don't do it at the counter because that's like it already is cutting the value of the philanthropy. And so there's a lot of issues that are being raised here. I think we can all agree that tax policy has largely been determined by the interests of the wealthy in the past. I'm glad to see them raising the profile of that issue. Mondale, what do you think about all this? Listen, that I mean, and this is not something I didn't know, but this just hearing that again, Bill Gates started the Gates Foundation. And then he could take all of his money and put it in the Bill Gates Foundation that, that him and his wife were running and it could just sit there forever. So I, 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 I am disgusted with the idea that they give 36 cent really, they're not giving a dollar, they're giving 36 cent and we're giving the bulk of that. Poor people are paying for the rich people to get tax breaks. That is absolutely disgusting. Thing to me, especially when we see uh, during a time like COVID, during a pandemic, where poverty grew and also their wealth grew. These richest people in America got richer during COVID, while poor people got poor. And just knowing that they financed that tax breaks on our backs is absolutely disgusting to me, John. So bad. Yeah. 100%. Um, as you point out, that they get tax, the tax breaks, but that also that they get to look cool. They get to look like they're the charitable ones. Um, so it's an issue like during your life. And I'll just briefly mention something that I've talked about before. 
There's like the pledges to give away their wealth when they die. And like lots of people are like, oh, that, that's so nice. It's so charitable. You're not gonna give it to your kids. I guess you're dead though. You got to use it for as long as you could. And now you're giving away. Look, I guess that's better than not giving it away, but just barely. It doesn't have anything to do with you anymore. You're dead. You can't use it. Give it away now. Okay, and maybe that's too much to ask. Maybe you need a little buffer where you get to enjoy your ability to buy islands at the drop of a hat or something. But every minute between now and when you die, the longer you wait, the less I give a damn about your charity because it doesn't mean anything if it doesn't affect you. It's giving if you've given. Once you're dead, you can't give anymore. Anyway. We have one other topic to get to, and that was raised at the Patriotic Millionaire Summit, and that has to do with uh, private jets. They're still all over the place. They briefly got talked about more during the pandemic, especially when celebrities would use them for like little micro flights and everything. They're still doing all that stuff, just to be clear. Take a look at this. Flying on a private jet is like cocaine. <laughs> it is the it is the coolest method of travel I've ever experienced, and it and it and it's tough, but. I'm kind of having a moment with my jet, and uh, and I'm and I'm really seriously considering selling it because I'm I'm challenged to square my my concern about the environment uh, and and my place in, in in mankind to continue to be so phenomenally selfish to be able to get on a jet all by myself for room for seven or eight more people in there. I'm in there all by myself except for the pilots, and it, I just don't think it's right. And uh, I'm, I'm 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 I've got it for sale, so. We'll see. Okay, like, um, small amount of credit. Why are people clapping? Like he still has it. He's still using it. All he said was like, "I'm starting to feel like this is a bit too much." And people are like, "Yes, yeah, no, this is not the end of the movie." Slow clap or whatever. The dude's gonna put down the mic. Drive his fancy car to the private airport and get back on the plane. Like maybe he'll give it up. And look, at least he's talking about it. Most of them don't even want you to know that they're doing all of this, that they're flying from Burbank to LAX or to whatever when they could, you know, be driving. But I don't know. I can't, I'm not gonna give a ton of credit for the guy who literally still has the plane, Mondale. What do you think? Ah, uh, John, come on. Like you 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 didn't think about the environment when you paid that much for the jet? <laughs> <laughs> like right now, like you, you just it just hit you at this summit. You just realized what kind of damage you were doing and how selfish you were being. Come on, guys. Like, <laughs> listen. Even if he sells the jet, guess what he's gonna do? He's still gonna lease one because he's not gonna fly commercial. <laughs> he's not talking about buying a ticket Maybe. or joining, getting a membership on Southwest. That's not what we're hearing right here. Trust me. Yeah. I got little. I have little credit. There's, the fact that he got a round of applause for this is where we are in this country. People are looking <laughs> and people are really being celebrated for something. Like you said, this is, goes back to the charitable thing. You're not being charitable when you're talking about selling or thinking about selling your private jet. Tell us, yeah. like, I mean, really, the idea of having or giving away your money when you die makes no sense to me. Okay, you got $56 billion, keep one. What imagine what change you can make in your life with $55 billion. Definitely, That's the type yeah. of change. This country used to tax people. Everything over, I think, a couple million dollars was taxed in the 40s at 90%, bro. 90%. And now we're down to 3.4%. That's why that's why our deficit is expanding. This is why we this is why we owe so much and why our social net safety net is crashing. Yeah. Yeah, and they were still getting wealthy, even with those taxes. They were still incentivized to work. Um, but anyway, again, the guy's one of the patriotic millionaires, so he's <laughs> he's better than the others. But just I, I love the idea of the guy like reclining in his massive seat. He takes the last bite of his creme brulee, sip of champagne, and thinks, "Am I the baddie? <laughs> You're doing okay. You're doing okay." Anyway, I'm having a moment with my plane is not anything I've ever had to say in my life. <laughs> anyway, with that said, um, you know, we're, we're gonna jump into this next topic right now. The hour is racing by. The governor of Oklahoma is now seeking the resignation of four different county officials after some truly appalling audio recordings have been released of explicitly racist comments being made on the one hand, and then Vague allusions to the possibility of murdering journalists as well. 
it's weird stuff, scary stuff. We're gonna jump into this first clip. Here's the pretty explicit racism for you. And then back in the day, would that like when Alan Marshall would take a damn blackjack, whoop their ass and throw them in the cell, I'd run for the chair. Yeah. Well, it's not like that no more. I know. We're taking that on <laughs> a mud creek and hang them up with the damn rope. Yeah. But you can't and do the that. Thing about it, they got more rights than we got. <laughs> Okay, that uh, was between the sheriff, his investigator, Alicia Manning, commissioners Mark Jennings, Robert Beck, commissioner secretary, Heather Carter, and jail administrator, Larry Hendricks. And although a little bit of that is hard to follow, a little bit garbled, um, they have more rights than we do is always a fun thing for someone like this to throw out there. And then of course, there are references to lynching people. So yeah, I think some resignations probably should be the ground floor for the consequences we should see from this. Mondale, what do you think? Every case tried under this administration should be brought back up. The DA or, or, or the sheriff, anybody implicit or that's been locked up because of this. If you're black, you just you just got your little reason to call a lawyer and say, look, racism had a role in what happened to me. This person believes that because you can no longer string me up like mud or over a mud lake or throw me in a cell and beat me, then I have more rights than them. It also is a time that he misses. So why is this person yeah. having the right to oversee anyone? This is the problem. This idea is the problem with our policing system in this country. It is people harboring these thoughts that black people having the right to challenge systems is more rights than them. What they're really saying is they have more rights than they should as black people. You shouldn't have the right to question because America for a long time believed that black people had no rights that a white man was obligated to listen to or respect. And this gentleman just said the same thing on tape. Yeah, they have more rights than us just means they have rights. And that, and I hate that. That's just, that's unacceptable. Something needs to be done about it. Um, but that wasn't the end of it. There was also a discussion about their plans to potentially murder two Gazette reporters, Chris and Bruce Willingham. Take a look at this. You know? They're insignificant in my life. Yes. <clears throat> they, they bring the whole thing. It goes around, goes around it. It will. I told you it will. Yeah. Well, I, know, I know where two big deep poles are if you ever need them. I got an escalator. Well, these are already free dug. Yeah, but the thing of it is, you know. We actually told the I've truth. Know, I've known two or three hit men that were very quiet guys. Yeah. And would cut no mercy. Yeah. Okay, that's uh, county officials talking about digging deep holes and uh, talking about the hitmen that they know. So it's not just you know devastating, obviously the the fact that you would joke about or talk about killing journalists or whatever, but like, so why are if you know these hitmen, why are they just out there existing? Feel like they should they should maybe be locked up? Why do I need to tell these officials what their job is supposed to be? Now, uh, governor, the governor Kevin Stitt. Who I can see people in the chat are like, uh, Stitt definitely agrees with all this. I'm not familiar with Kevin Stitt very much, but he says, I am both appalled and disheartened to hear of the horrid comments made by officials in McCurtain County. There's simply no place for such hateful rhetoric in the state of Oklahoma, especially by those that serve to represent the community through their respective office. And um, there's also a, a long statement from the sheriff's office. I'm not sure we're gonna be able to get uh, to, but there was a big protest trying to put pressure on them to do something. So. We'll see what happens, Mondale. Any any final thoughts about what you've heard? I mean, listen, we have a governor, right? That that like I like the comment said, absolutely, you know, shows and ex, ex, exemplifies behaviors that it lines up with this. The idea, though, we have county and and, and law enforcement, law enforcement who's supposed to be out here against these thugs, bragging about knowing two or three hitmen that won't cut these journalists any slack. Is absolutely disgusting, and someone needs to investigate who these hitmen and who have they hit. Yeah, yeah. By the way, um, I I don't know for sure. This is a bit of speculation on my part, but my guess would be that every one of those people that you just heard who are talking about lynching black people and uh, murdering journalists uh, <laughs> support the elimination of abortion rights because of their deeply held Christian religious beliefs. <laughs> After all, they're pro-life, and thou shalt not kill. Except if it's someone of a different race or a journalist who's investigating you, then there's a couple of exceptions. I think that's in the subtext of the Ten Commandments. It was worn away by wind and time, but it was probably there. Anyway, we're gonna see what happens with that. We do have a lot more to get to, but first a break, we'll be back in a few.
A 20 year old woman was shot and killed by a homeowner in upstate New York on Saturday after the car she was in accidentally turned into the wrong driveway. And the time it took them to back out and turn around, the guy came out and shot and eventually killed her. Kaylin Gillis is the woman, you can see a photo of her here from a GoFundMe. Um, you know, in America, our health, our you know, health insurance system is such garbage that this sort of thing is necessary. So if you want to give, it is available. Uh, Kaylin Gillis was with three of her friends trying to find another friend's house in rural Hebron, or Hebron, um, New York, when they mistakenly pulled up to the house owned by 65-year-old Kevin Monahan. They quickly realized their mistake and were turning the car around when he stepped onto his porch and fired two shots, one of which struck Gillis. They had to drive five miles to the town of Salem to be able to call 911. The reception wasn't good in that area. CPR was performed, but she was pronounced dead on the scene. One of the sheriffs involved in this says it's a very sad incident involving an innocent young woman. There was clearly no threat from anyone in the vehicle. There was no no reason for Monahan to feel threatened. He wasn't aware of any interaction between them. No one exited the vehicle and it was in the driveway for a very short time. Monahan has thankfully already been charged with murder in the second degree and remains in custody. He was initially uncooperative with investigators, refusing for several hours to exit his residence or answer questions. I don't know all of the state laws in New York. I am hoping that because it's not like Texas or Florida or something, that this should be illegal. In some states, it would really be an open question as to whether you can just begin firing shots randomly at someone who happened to be in your driveway. The sheriff there said, Mondale, that there was no reason to feel threatened. And that's what I question. Not that there was anything particular about Gillis or her friends or just being in the driveway. But gun owners are given reasons every single day in America to be terrified of literally everything. They are constantly told that you need to defend your territory. It's your castle, people are coming for you, immigrants and whoever. Black Lives Matter and MS-13 and everybody is just waiting to storm across your yard and break into your foyer. So you need to be ready to go out there and shoot first and ask questions will probably never. They'll ask you questions when they haul you in. They never talk about the legal process after that, but this life was totally needlessly lost. Young person just trying to go to a friend's house and it is a crapshoot, you know, pardon the, the terminology of when you come up on a person's house, whether they're going to be an absolutely insane person with access to military grade hardware. What do you think? John, in any other industrialized nation, this young lady will still be alive. Yep. Nowhere in the world except for America, do you turn, you make a mistake and turn around in someone's driveway and you leave dead. You leave dead for turning into the wrong driveway. This is absolutely ridiculous. Last year, this country sold and purchased more than 15.6 million guns. Already this year, more than 12,000 people have died from guns. In this country alone, we're not talking about across the world. We have a problem that this country is not willing to deal with. And I'm telling you, the idea that they're selling fear to these people with so many guns is absolutely ridiculous. We can almost tell what party people are by how many guns they own. There's studies that show if you are a member of the NRA, 77% are Republicans. If you are a member of NRA, 77 plus percent are white and they own 5.6 guns each member. We are ridiculously okay. killing people that don't have to die because of the selling of fear to people with this much ammunition. People are killing people for this idea that they feel threatened and the threat is never there, has never been there and is not real. It's not grounded in anything other than politician and people that need to sell guns doing just that, selling themselves yeah. and selling guns. They, they, they tell us that everyone will be safer if everybody just has a gun. And in case after case, the only thing that turned it into a tragedy was that someone regrettably had a gun. In this case, if that guy, had just let let's say that there was never going to be a world where he wasn't constantly terrified of literally everyone around him. As long as he doesn't have a gun, we don't have a problem. He gets to go through his life being terrified of literally everything and nobody needs to die. There was that story of the couple that was like walking on the sidewalk outside of someone's house and the guy got scared and just started firing at them. If only they didn't have a gun, then this wouldn't have happened. We're going to talk about Ralph Yarl again in a second. 
if only they didn't have a gun, people would be alive. That was the determining factor. It wasn't the person or their totally needless fear. It was the fact that they had an easy way to kill people from far away. Anyway, he's at least been charged, but he's not the only one. Let's jump now to this update. Andrew Lester is the 84 year old who has now been identified as the one who shot Ralph Yarl just a short time ago. Now, thankfully, the update has is that he has been charged with first degree assault and armed criminal action in the shooting of Ralph Yarl. You can see Andrew Lester here in this shot, that's the the individual who set all of this off. And of course, Ralph Yarl will remind you that his family has a GoFundMe for the both the legal effort as well as the medical expenses. If you're not familiar with the story, he's a 16 year old high schooler had just been trying to pick his brothers up when he went to the wrong address and rang the doorbell twice. And that was all it took for Andrew Lester to decide that he was going to execute this young boy. Now here's how he tells it, he says that he was in his bed when he heard his doorbell ring and grabbed a handgun before answering, adding that he was, quote, scared to death by Jarl's size. He stated he believed someone was attempting to break into the house and shot twice through an exterior door, storm door within a few seconds of opening the main door. Jarl was shot twice, struck in the left forehead and right arm. And um, I don't believe literally anything that this insane, likely racist old man says. Um, the idea that you were just scared of the size of a black teenager is, look, whether it's just an excuse or a truth, racists are, they do overestimate the age and size of people who aren't white. That we know is the way that racists work implicitly. Um, you believe that he was trying to break into the house? I'm not a burglar or anything. But I don't think that they teach you to ring the doorbell multiple times if you're trying to break in. That usually will alert people to your presence. So no, I don't believe literally any of this. It's good news that he's been charged, we'll see what happens. The other bit of good news, and this is honestly a miracle. Um, but family member of Yarf, Ralph Yarl said that after three nights in the hospital, he's now been brought home and continues to improve. I am just going to assume that he should be home after just three days. It's entirely possible that our healthcare system is so devastatingly broken that you only get three nights to recover in the hospital. But regardless, the fact that he is able to go home is a miracle after being shot twice, including in the head. And so, uh, Mondale, what, what do you think about this tragic situation? Um, I think you know, the, and I, I appreciate you uh, pointing out the fact that this this man's statement should hold no water, no ground, um, because that second shot was not an immediate shot. It was actually after he shot this young man in the head, he then shot him. He said to him, don't come around here and then shot him the second time. And if this kid wouldn't have put his hand up, he, that bullet wouldn't have been in his hand or been through his heart and he probably wouldn't have lived. So we also need to tell the part that this kid not only, not only was shot by this man, America sold this kid out when he got up and ran to two neighbors house and they turned him away. And it wasn't until he got to the third neighbors who said, Get on the ground, made this kid lay on the ground with a gun pointed at him, tell him to raise his hands, and then he called the police. So this kid has been shot, blood leaking out of his hand and head, has been forced to lay on the ground again with a gun pointed at him by a neighbor who is also afraid, like you said, of the big black man who was 16 yeah. year old honor student bandmate. And it's absolutely disgusting that we find ourselves in this place in America where People with guns can just pretend to be afraid and say anything. This is the problem with the, the castle doctrine and also stand your ground. You could just say I was afraid or well, this person was on my property and you can just start shooting at people as if they're hunting. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that like there's no, to me at least, I'm only speaking for myself. The idea that your emotional state should determine whether something is legal or not, I think is insane. But even if you believe that there was a context where your fear justifies whatever violence you want, America doesn't get to have that. Not America, where people are trained from birth to be utterly terrified of literally everyone, but especially certain groups constantly. No, you don't get that as an excuse. We'll see what ends up turning up in this. I'm glad, thankfully, that you know maybe they never were going to do the charges, and it was just the protests that sprang up that caused them to. But either way, that's I guess the way that America works. There are charges now. We'll see what ends up happening, and you know, just happy that that Ralph somehow survived this terrible violence.
With that said, that is unfortunately all the time we have for the first hour of the show. There's a lot more to come in the aftermath though. So everyone don't go anywhere, we'll be right back. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.